I share your passion for doing better. And in fact, I'm very happy to see many of our students here in the gallery watching these debates intensely. You are our future. Now, over the past seven months, we have engaged many Singaporeans, including students and over 5,000 educators, to discuss our nation's future and how education can help us get there. Your voices echo the passion that many of us have heard, many have heard in our Singapore conversation. I've heard many rich and varied discussions firsthand. Through the conversation, many Singaporeans have reaffirmed the strengths of our education system and advocated that we build on them. But many participants also noted that there are areas where we must continue to recalibrate and even to take a fresh approach. Allow me to touch on three areas today. First, reaffirming our commitment to provide the best opportunities for every child. These efforts include preschool education, leveling up all our students, expanding post-secondary options, and supporting students with special needs. Second, recalibrating towards holistic education centered on values. And third, refreshing our approaches to achieve our basic goals of education. Let me first reaffirm the government's commitment to provide opportunities for all our children to excel. This is important to building a more inclusive society and is important to enabling our students and our young people to seize opportunities and access high quality jobs as we restructure our economy. The Minister for Finance outlined a number of key MOE initiatives in the budget speech, including expanding school-based student care centres, developing online resources and expanding the Opportunity Fund. MOE will provide details on this at a later date. I fully agree with my parliamentary colleagues that our education system must provide opportunities, and Mr Lim Biao Chan spoke at this right at the outset. Indeed, over the decades, the government has almost doubled the investment in education, from $6.5 billion in 2003 to $11.6 billion this year. These investments have supported three broad changes in our education system. First, we have invested more in developing well-rounded students who can think creatively and independently. Recent results in Teams and PERS showed our students doing well, but more importantly, doing better in reasoning and analysis. And as you can see from the charts, Singapore is in the top in P4 reading, P4 maths, P4 science, SEC2 maths, and SEC2 science, right there among the best performing systems in the world. Now, second, students now have more choices at all levels through the many more pathways to develop their abilities and interests. At the secondary level, we have a diversity of schools with niches and programs catering to a wide range of talents and interests. At the post-secondary level, we have more options at the polytechnics and ITE with better facilities and programs. And at the university level, we are also expanding options. Third, we have raised the number and quality of our teaching professionals. We now employ 30% more teachers than a decade ago and are investing more in their professional development. Experienced principals and skillful teachers are distributed across our schools so that all our schools will be good schools. I thank Mr. Lim Biao Chuan for speaking on the importance of good teachers. And earlier, Mr. Lau, Ms. Lau Yen Ling and Mr. Yi Jian Zhang also spoke about class size and teachers. Indeed, the additional teachers that we have and the additional resources that we have have translated into better pupil teacher ratio. In 2012, our primary school has a pupil teacher ratio of 14.2 compared to 25.9 in 2000, just 12 years ago. In the secondary school, our pupil teacher ratio is 17.6 compared to 19.2 in 2000. Our pupil teacher ratio is comparable across, or comparable with OECD average, and better than the UK and Korea. Now, I'll touch on how schools are using these additional teaching resources to help students level up. Now, this high quality of education throughout our system, from primary to secondary to post-secondary, allows us to build, to provide better opportunities for all our students today. Less than 1% of each cohort do not complete secondary education, compared to 5% just 10 years ago. 
More than 94% of each cohort progressed to post-secondary education compared to 86% a decade ago. This is a significant achievement, but is this enough for the future? Today, around 30% of our economically active adults over the age of 50 do not have anything more than a primary school education. Many find it hard to upgrade or retrain for better jobs. As MPs, we see many of our residents in this group seeking help. In the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years, we do not know how the world will turn out. But the best guess is that the pace of change is going to be even faster. So we must take a long-term view of education. To enable Singaporeans to continually learn, unlearn, and relearn, every child needs a strong foundation for lifelong learning. MOE will aim for every student in our schools to complete secondary education, and we want our students to then go on to pursue a post-secondary qualification. The only way to reach every one of our students in this effort is to ensure every school is a good school, delivering good programs for the majority of our students. On top of this, we must also enhance our efforts to level up our students who may need additional help because we want every Singaporean to succeed. Now, thankfully, we are doing this from a position of strength. In the most recent Teams and Pearl study, an international benchmarking study, only about 1% to 4% of students in Singapore fell below the low benchmark of competence across all grades, primary 4 and secondary 2 and, and subjects. This is significantly better than what we achieved a decade ago and far better than the international average of 12 to 27%. This is no mean achievement. But 1 to 4% is still too many for us. We must aim to do better. To do this, we must start young. Prime Minister said at the National Day Rally in August last year that we will invest substantial resources in preschool education. DPM Thaman also spoke about this in this year's budget speech. Dr. Lily Neo made a strong pitch for good preschool education earlier. Indeed, a good preschool education helps a child to develop self-confidence and social skills to nurture values such as sharing, taking turns, and being responsible, to build a good foundation for the learning of languages, and to develop the disposition for learning, such as curiosity and the courage to try new things. Let me emphasize that the value of a good kindergarten education is not in learning academic content. Our children should have a holistic development through a quality kindergarten education. This is especially important for those from the low-income groups who may need more support. To provide opportunities and to enhance social mobility, we must help all our children start well in life. And the government will invest significantly more in preschool. I recognize that many parents have urged the government to nationalize the preschool sector. Many members too. Mr. Zainuddin Nordin had said this as early as a decade ago and earlier in the earlier budget debate, we heard Mr. Chris D'Souza making the same point, and earlier Mr. Nispoir as well. Today, we have a diversified kindergarten and childcare sector, commercial operators, anchor operators, and VWOs. Each brings a certain value. I know of several educators who have set up kindergartens to pursue the deep conviction in the value of early childhood education and have built up innovative programs. I respect their dedication and the diversity and choices they offer to parents. The diversified landscape serves parents well today. Our most important priority now is to work together to raise the quality. Arising from the work of the Implementation Committee for Enhancing Preschool Education, which Minister Chan Chun Seng and I co-chair, there are five areas of focus for uplifting the quality of preschool education. Of these five areas, MOE will take the lead in three. First, we'll continue to develop the kindergarten curriculum and educators, resource, educators' guides and share teaching and learning resources with operators. This complements the revised curriculum framework for kindergarten. Second, 
We will leverage on the existing programs in our institutes of higher learning to provide high quality training and professional development for kindergarten level teachers. Third, MOE will run some kindergartens. For a start, MOE will set up 15 pilot kindergartens in the next three years. Five of these will enroll K1 children in January 2014. Some of these will be located in primary schools, some in community sites. All will be within HDB Heartlands. These kindergartens will first and foremost provide a quality education that will be affordable to Singaporeans. Our specialists will develop teaching and learning resources and best practices to enhance children's learning. We will also work with other preschool centres that offer good programmes to study different approaches. Best practices that are scalable, sustainable and suitable for the Singapore context will be distilled and shared with other preschool operators to catalyse improvements across the sector. I must emphasise at the outset that this is a pilot program. MOE believes that we can leverage on our resources to provide quality kindergartens and act as a catalyst for the entire sector. Given the growing demand for quality kindergarten, MOE is prepared to go beyond our 15 pilot centres. But how far and how fast MOE proceeds will depend on our experience and assessment of it and the feedback from parents. As it is, MOE has heavy responsibilities and an expansion into providing affordable, quality kindergartens in the heartlands is a significant undertaking. MOE will not undertake this lightly unless there is strong public support for it and unless our assessment is that we are creating significant value for parents and children. There are also important logistical and staffing issues that we will need to look into. We will therefore gather the views of the public and the various stakeholders as we formulate plans for the medium term. Meanwhile, MOE and MSF will continue to work together with other operators through the newly formed Early Childhood Development Agency to expand capacity and raise standards while keeping fees affordable for the majority of Singaporeans. We will announce details of the first five locations and admission procedures in about two weeks, and SMS Indrani will provide further details on some of our other efforts, while MSF will elaborate on the other two areas of focus. So I thank Ms. Lau Yen Ling for pointing out the many tasks ahead for the Early Childhood Development Agency. Building a good foundation at the kindergarten level is an important initiative in developing engaged learners. Let me now speak about how, at the next stage, our schools will equip our students to succeed. I want to thank Dr. Lili Neo for your suggestions on how we can level up. Students enter primary school with different dispositions and readiness for learning. Sometimes this is due to learning difficulties, but often, it is a lack of home and parental support for learning. Some parents are keen to help, but do not know how. Others are preoccupied with making ends meet or with family problems. Some students come to school with low expectations of what they can achieve and are not putting in enough effort. To address this, MOE will embark on a comprehensive program to level up our students. This will help every Singaporean child, regardless of family background, start from a quality kindergarten and then build a strong foundation in the 10 years of primary and secondary education. This is especially important for students from disadvantaged backgrounds or who need more dedicated support. This levelling up efforts will be integrated with our overall approach in our schools to develop engaged learners. In other words, it is not a standalone programme. Students who need help in specific areas will be given more attention and resources. When they have achieved the baseline mastery, they will be taught using other learning approaches. This is a student-centric approach in the spirit of what educators call differentiated teaching, or in Chinese, ying cai shi jiao. Our levelling up efforts will nurture engaged learners through four prongs. Let me speak on each of these in turn. 
The first prong is building confidence and the motivation to achieve. This is the core of learning. A child must feel that, yes, I want to do it, and yes, I can do it. A teacher must set suitable challenges and help each child experience success. We must create a virtuous cycle of effort, success, confidence, effort. Effort leading to success, success leading to confidence, and confidence leading to more effort. This is especially important for those from disadvantaged backgrounds. So we need efforts from all parties. First, building confidence at preschool levels and extending this in our schools. And we'll infuse this in our school curriculum, CCAs, and character and citizenship curriculum. Second, working with school-based student care centres to reinforce the efforts of our schools for students who need extra support. Not just ensuring that they do homework, but nurturing a resilience to succeed. Third, we'll intensify partnerships with parents, self-help groups, and community organisations. Parents play a critical role. SPS Hawazi will elaborate on this later. The second prong in bu is building literacy and numeracy foundations. In our preschool, MOE already provides literacy assistance to 250 preschool centres. This helps children from low-income backgrounds who are from a non-English speaking environment. This is done through one-on-one -on -one sessions or in small groups. Over the next two years, we'll provide this assistance to another 100 preschool centres. The Lee Kuan Yew Fund for Bilingualism will catalyse preschool bilingualism efforts. Such efforts will help our children build a strong foundation in English and their mother tongue language from young. In our schools, we're helping all our children learn through better research-based methods. Stellar for English language and literacy and a concrete pictorial abstract for numeracy. For the mother tongue languages, Students learn through appropriate modules and methods that take into account their linguistic abilities and their home language environment. For students who start primary school with weaker foundations in literacy and numeracy, we have the Learning Support Programme for English and Mathematics. We'll now take a further major step to provide specialised help to more students so that they can achieve a higher level of baseline competency in literacy and numeracy from primary school all the way to secondary school. As these students learn in different ways and at a different pace, we will implement several learning programs and novel teaching approaches to engage them. This will level up our students at zero cost to them. Students from lower income families, which many of you have spoken about, will get the extra support they need from our schools. Schools can choose from a menu of approaches and programs. For example, different teaching methods. Learning algebra can be too abstract for many students. Understanding the meaning and the manipulating expressions with numbers, X and Ys can be challenging. So some teachers are using learning aids like the LGDIS in Bedok View Secondary School. The second approach is to use different teaching arrangements. For children who lack confidence and need more structure, schools may provide small group teaching and break the learning tasks into smaller parts. This is used, for example, to support English literacy at Ta Chiao Primary School. Now, a third area is online resources, and Ms. Denise Paul spoke passionately about this earlier on, and I agree with her. In fact, online interactive resources can be used to help strengthen language skills which can be integrated into our lessons and be accessed by our students in their own time and pace and that's suited to their learning needs. And we will explore how we can use online resources more extensively. Now, having piloted these approaches in several schools, we'll progressively implement this and other similar initiatives in schools in the next two years. Now, the third prong is skillful teachers. We'll resource our schools with skillful teachers to do this well. Schools with greater need will have more teachers deployed to them. Our teachers will also work with our specialists to constantly improve these programs and approaches through action research and determine the relative effectiveness of each of these for different students. MOE will launch a comprehensive training program for the primary and secondary school teachers who will lead this effort. 
This will enable them to better identify the learning gaps of their students and to customise how they teach. So I fully agree with Dr Intan's call for MOE to provide specialised training for teachers of NT students. You gave a very passionate account of your teaching experience. And like you, we recognise that students often improve because they are motivated by their teachers who also provide them with social-emotional support. And we'll continue to study how we can further improve this. And I welcome your suggestions, Dr Intan. The fourth prong is a whole school approach. This comprehensive levelling up effort will build on initiatives announced at last year's COS, such as the expansion of student care centres in schools and significant moves to increase support for students from less advantaged backgrounds. This includes enhancements to the MOE financial assistance schemes and school-based financial assistance scheme, the EduSafe Merit Bursary and the School Breakfast Program. I'm happy to report that I've met many of the students who have benefited from these schemes, uh, as well as their parents, and these are well used and well appreciated. But as our comprehensive program to level up our students is being rolled out, there are students who are about to complete secondary schools. They will not have the opportunity to benefit from this effort. So instead, we will pilot a program in ITE, the Extended NITEC Foundation Program, to help these students build up their literacy and numeracy skills during their, their NITEC years and to enable them to complete the NITEC course. The aim is not to extend their stay in ITE, rather it is to give them an opportunity to go further. So let me summarise what this levelling up program is about. When fully rolled out, this comprehensive program for levelling up students will ensure that any student who needs additional help to achieve a strong foundation in numeracy and literacy will get it. We have added a range of differentiated learning programs and teaching approaches that are better than simply reducing their class size. We'll provide training to all teachers who need it. On top of this, we'll deploy 600 more teachers. MOE's priority is to allocate our teaching resources to where they can make a major difference. Now, I want to thank many members of the public as well as educators who, in our Singapore conversation, wanted a Singapore that provides opportunities for all and a society that takes care of those from disadvantaged backgrounds. Your inputs provided important inspiration. So the purpose of this levelling up effort is simple. It's about providing the best opportunities for every child to succeed, regardless of their background and pace of development. Every child has the potential and power to succeed in school and in life if he or she puts in the effort. The new initiatives are to ensure that every child fulfils his or her potential and special attention is given to those from disadvantaged backgrounds. This is about hope, it is about inclusion. Having equipped our students with a strong foundation, we will continue to do more to ensure a range of attractive options at the post-secondary level. We have established world-class polytechnics and, and the Institute for, for Technical Education. With the opening of ITE College Centre in Amokyo this year, we have completed the transformation of ITE to one ITE system, three colleges. We are further diversifying options for university. The Singapore Institute of Technology will become an autonomous university and SIM University SIM, UNISIM will start to offer government-funded full-time degree programs. They will, they will have many new programs to suit different interests, passions and learning style. Ms. Mary Liu spoke about access to university places earlier and SMS Indrani will elaborate on our efforts in the higher education sector later. MOE will also continue to support children with special needs. We have progressively increased government funding to special education schools. Indeed, MOE funding per student in the, to the special school is much more than in a mainstream school. MOE also provides professional support to SPED schools to refine, customise and implement their curriculum. Guidance support for parents has also been enhanced. We will continue to support children with mild special needs in our mainstream schools. All primary schools are staffed with at least one allied educator in learning and behavioural support. 
and all schools have a core group of teachers trained in supporting students with special needs. In primary schools, we are piloting remediation support for students with dyslexia because it is a condition that has good prognosis and affects many students. Results of the pilots are encouraging and we will expand this program to twice as many schools this year. As we work on different approaches to teaching and learning in our schools, we will share this with SPAT schools and see how this can be usefully adapted. SPS Sim ends will elaborate on our efforts for students with special needs. Mr. Zainal Sapari asked the government to extend EduSafe to students who are studying in full-time madrasas. Having Singaporean children enroll in national schools allows them to share a common educational experience and forge a national identity. However, the government also recognises that madrasas play an important role in training religious teachers for the Muslim community. MOE currently provides support on teaching resources and training for madrasas through MOIS. But we note the concerns raised by Mr Zainer. I will study this issue further. Let me now move on to talk about how we need to recalibrate towards holistic education centred on values. Ms Irene Ng spoke passionately on the importance of values education and that the right attitude lasts a lifetime. I fully agree with you. At, the, at our Singapore conversation, many Singaporeans have also surfaced the desire for broader definitions of success in our society and that our students must acquire the skills and competencies to benefit from the quality economic growth that we are pursuing. Many participants also want to see a society with diverse definitions of success. We will continue to emphasise holistic development of our students. Let me share briefly how this is happening in our schools. I recently visited Ganning Singh Primary School and saw how changes introduced in recent years have significantly changed the way our students learn. Guided by the belief that the environment is a third teacher, the school has created a rich, learner-centred environment. The Arts Jam stage allows pupils to come forward to perform and in the process, develop their confidence and talents. During my visits, students sing with gusto. A big group of students were dancing to the Gangnam Style tune in the school canteen during recess. They invited me to join, me, join them, but thankfully they spared me. <laughs> outdoor education learning areas, such as the bordering wall and the outdoor education space, are also designed as learning spaces. Now, pupils in Gunning Singh Primary, Primary School come from the neighbourhood and they exude confidence. It was joyful for me and the teachers to see them enjoying their school experience. This is not just happening in Gunning Singh Primary School, but in many other schools too, many of which parents may not know about. And MOE will do more to publicise what, what are being done in our various schools. Now, in addition, our schools will continue to emphasise character and values education. And I'm very heartened that this is something that resonates strongly with Singaporeans as well as with our educators. During our Singapore conversation, many have talked about a more caring and cohesive Singapore with a strong kampong spirit, a Singaporean society anchored on values, where we have a greater sense of togetherness and community, and also share a stronger national identity. Character and citizenship education in schools is progressing well and will remain a key emphasis going forward. This does not just take place in specific CCE periods, but across a range of subjects and activities through a whole school approach. For instance, through values in action, students learn learns values through sustained community involvement. I have many examples of how this values in action is being done in schools, but I shall not get into the details here. What I'll say is that we will enhance our support to schools for CCE. First, we'll develop a core group of CCE teacher mentors in each school who are equipped with the knowledge and skills to lead in the whole school CCE efforts. Second, and I think many members will welcome this, we'll bring back a refreshed Hao Kong Ming series of textbooks, now called Hao Ping Te, Hao Kong Ming. 
We will have similar versions in the Malay and Tamil languages, as you can see on, on the screen. It has been updated with Singapore stories and lessons that will resonate with students' experiences in life and suggested activities for parents to get involved. Indeed, parents played a key and decisive role in developing values and character in our children. We will strengthen partnership with parents and the community, and SPS Hawazi will provide an update. A continued focus on CCE will stand Singapore in good stead as we face new challenges together. It can help nurture the Singaporean, the participants at the OSC have said they wish to see in the future. In the words of one participant, I quote, a Singaporean, confident yet humble and generous in heart, always seeking to learn and improve, dignified and respectful, but also assertive in voicing his or her concerns in a sensible way, unquote. Let me now speak on the theme of refreshing our approaches to achieve our basic goals of education and how we need to get back to basics and look at the fundamentals. Over the years, we have evolved our education system to enable Singaporeans to have a better future. Our mission has not changed. However, how MOE goes about achieving it has. Since 2011, we have shifted towards a student-centric, values-driven education and are striving to make every school a good school. Character and citizenship education is receiving greater attention. And as many of you have noted, this shift has received good feedback from Singaporeans and good support from many educators and parents. This COS, I provided an outline of some very important measures that we have launched to level up our students. Our education system must always provide hope, and what is more, provide hope for all. Looking ahead, there is much more that we need to do. But first, we must recognise and consider a few key trends. The fast-changing global, global situation. There are many more millions joining the global marketplace, each wanting a better life, and technology is driving changes faster than ever. In education, we need to equip our next generation to be highly skilled, but also flexible and adaptable. Excellence remains a relevant goal, but we need to be broader in how we define and measure merits. And excellence and merits in any individual student need to be twinned with an ethical dimension of integrity and social responsibility. Our society is now more developed than before, and how and high social mobility will become harder to achieve. Naturally, successful parents will strive to give their children a leg up. Our education system must continue to provide opportunities for all, regardless of their parents' position. We must remain inclusive and provide opportunities for our children from different backgrounds to grow up together. Our expectations and aspirations are much higher today than ever. We are a very competitive people. Indeed, in many of the meetings and discussions I go to, we are not just content to be just happy. We want to be the happiest people on earth. In some ways, this trait is very endearing, yet it also means that we sometimes set very difficult and contradictory goals for ourselves. We need to be easier on ourselves and focus on what really matters and strive for balance. Our ageing population and tightening labour markets, as a result of that, will make it harder to attract and retain the right people, people with a heart for teaching and will go the extra mile for our children. So much as we have a long-term goal of investing in our teaching force to make each teacher highly skilled, our young people have many career options. And indeed, we educate them so that they can have these options. Now, these trends are very relevant to the next phase of our Singapore conversation on education. We face the complex challenges that many members have spoken about passionately, from stress, tuition and exams to streaming. Let me deal with some of these challenges. These challenges are complex because there are no easy answers. 
there are significant trade-offs among the multiple objectives. Some changes may benefit one group, while another may feel they will lose out. What may seem good in the short term may bring adverse consequences later. And given how the different parts of our system are linked to each other, we simply cannot change one part without affecting another. We also have to remember that education is always a complex issue because it is tied deeply to our values as a people. We can indeed learn from other systems, we should be humble enough to learn and to pick the best practices. And in fact, we have done so, including Finland, that many of you spoke about. But we cannot borrow wholesale as our context is different. We have to challenge our own mindsets and decide on what matters most to each of us. We have to go back to the basics and ask what we want to see in our children as they grow up beyond just academic grades. Now, for a start, much as our system is not perfect, it is studied by many nations all over the world, not only for what we do for our high achievers, but also for how we uplift all our students. Indeed, MOE's mission has been and continues to be to deliver a quality education, not just in a handful of good schools and universities, but to more than half a million students in schools and over 100,000 students in our institutes of higher learning. Our success so far in equipping Singaporeans to meet the challenges of the future is a deep strength and a strength which many nations would love to have. The challenges we are grappling with therefore need to be always viewed in perspective so that we do not throw the baby out with the bathwater. But we shall not cease exploring how we can build even better schools, institutions and universities. And I'm very encouraged by the many voices we have heard in our Singapore conversation, including from over 5,000 educators in the first phase. From what we have heard so far, including views which have been articulated in this house, I discern two key areas where we need more in-depth conversations. First, many parents and students feel that our education system is too focused on examinations and grades. This excessive focus has several consequences. Some of you have highlighted this. Let me add to the list for completeness. First, it may come at the expense of the development of well-rounded individuals, including the character and values of the student which ultimately matters most. It may come at the expense of learning, as students study to the test, and teachers respond by teaching to the test, rather than to stimulate curiosity and a love for learning. Students may choose subjects, and indeed, schools may offer subjects based on how easy it is to score good grades, rather than their, on their intrinsic value. And the recent debate over literature, which Ms. Janice Coast brought up, is a case in point. Other forms of talent in the arts, sports, music, leadership ability, applied skills using both hands and head, and so on, are not sufficiently recognised. We should not just have an exam-based meritocracy, rather, we should have a talent-centric meritocracy that recognises talent in a wide range of areas. A major consequence of a single-minded focus on examinations is stress, in particular, stress related to competition and high-stake examinations, such as the PSLE, which Mr. Nispo and several others have spoken about. Mr. Lim Biao Chuan indeed started this debate by speaking vividly of stress. Yeah. Now you know why the education minister is also very stressed, <laughs> just listening to you. <laughs> now, indeed, some mothers, I believe including some in this house, take leave for an entire year or more to help their children prepare for the PSLE. Many see entry into top schools as critical to their children's future and prepare their children very early, some as early as kindergartens, and even sending them to two kindergartens. Many compete to get a place in popular primary schools or spend significantly on tuition, as Mr. Lau had also mentioned. Others worry about their children being streamed into normal streams and suffer from the labelling and stigma associated with it. Some teachers who are committed to helping their students succeed may give a lot of homework 
or set tests that are difficult to stretch their students, but all with good intent. So I appreciate the stress that parents, students, and educators feel. This is an important issue. Now, some are also concerned about the effects of competition. Successful students may develop a narrow competitive mindset. They may come to believe that I have succeeded because I worked hard, so I deserve nothing but the best for myself. So while there are concerns about high-stake exams, I've also heard other views, and there are others who see merits in the current system. Many feel that the current system sets clear standards. Many students have told me that exams challenge them to learn better. Teachers use exams to determine students' mastery of the different subjects and tailor their teaching strategies accordingly. In a public education system, exams provide us with a standardized measure of progression and achievement and ensure accountability across the system to uphold rigorous standards. And in fact, this is one of the reasons why public examination started. Now, it also provides an objective way of determining entry into the next level of education. And in Singapore, exams have helped assure a very high average among our students. And that is why our students, even those who have done, have scored average, perform so well when they go overseas. Now, some countries, such as the UK, Japan, and Korea, and some states in the US that abolished exams or made this easier are now reversing costs. Their experience has been that while removing exams was popular and brought short-term relief, over time, insidiously, standards fall. They are now concerned that the youths are not equipped to compete in a global marketplace. And I should note that the people who suffer the most when educational standards drop in these countries are not the best students, but the average students. That is why in some places they say that while they may have high peaks, they also have deep valleys. As for the stress that comes with high-stake exams, many have also observed that some amount of stress is almost unavoidable. While excessive and prolonged stress is bad, a right amount of stress can bring out the best in each of us. But what is the optimal depends on each individual. Some parents have also said that some amount of competition is necessary. It is a reality of working life, and equipping our students to learn this early in life strengthens them for the future. And indeed, this issue of stress and competition is not unique to Singapore. Some of you may have read in New York, parents queue up to admit their children into high-end kindergartens while a recent report noted that in the UK, rich parents pay up to £80,000 a year or $150,000 to hire well-qualified private tutors. The common position is that we all want our children to get ahead in life, whether in Singapore or anywhere else in the world. And the higher the aspiration, the greater the drive. The question we have to ask is, what exactly will ensure that our children can get ahead and be successful in the face of global competition, and not just relative to other Singaporeans. Now, the second area, which some of you mentioned, but not as much, is that of opportunities, social mobility, and inclusion. Some parents are concerned that without tuition, their children cannot cope or cannot do well enough to excel. Others, and I think Ms. Mary Liu spoke about this earlier, yeah. Others whose children are doing well want them to do even better and procure all sorts of tuition and enrichment classes to help them advance. Some are concerned that in some schools, students tend to come from similar socioeconomic backgrounds and have similar academic abilities. Without the opportunity to interact with students from different backgrounds and academic abilities, our students may not develop empathy and our society may lose its cohesiveness. Some have also cautioned that if we mix up our students too much, it will be harder to cater to the learning needs of different groups. We will lose our peaks of excellence and also fail to support those who, who may fall behind without different approaches. So I've given a long list of issues and viewpoints 
And let me summarize that there are real tensions and differences in views amongst parents and educators. Some want rigorous examinations so as to maintain standards and accountability, while others want a well-rounded, holistic education that calibrates stress so as to bring out the best in each student and create multiple opportunities for individuals to excel within a more inclusive system. I've been thinking long and hard about these issues and we have many sessions with our educators on this. And before we change our major policies, we must get back to fundamentals. First, reaffirm the basic goals of education and second, in the light of changing circumstances I outlined earlier and the differences in views, the fundamental strategy of how we will achieve these goals. So in the spirit of the Singapore conversation, let me highlight some ideas for discussion. On the basic goals of education, allow me to highlight a few for, dis for discussion. We must first and foremost provide opportunities for every child to actualize his or her potential to be the best that he or she can be. And to achieve this, we develop a love for learning, stimulate a lively curiosity about the world around us, and urge to explore and discover. Develop well-rounded individuals of integrity and sound character with strong social emotional maturity. Build a strong foundation, especially in self-confidence, literacy and numeracy, analytical and inventive thinking, communication skills and other 21st century competencies, so as to prepare Singaporeans to be lifelong learners and succeed in a more globally competitive environment, and develop their abilities and interests in each child, so that he, may, he or she may go on in life to pursue this interest with passion, realise his or her aspirations, and have a fulfilling career. And second, to nurture in each child a sense of responsibility to his fellow human beings and a sense of commitment and loyalty to Singapore and to fellow Singaporeans, so that he or she can contribute to taking Singapore forward. To realise these goals, we have to rethink the fundamental approaches in tandem with changes in policy. First, we have to see education as a lifelong journey, not a destination. It is an exciting journey of continual learning, discovery and mastery, not a competitive sprint. This means learning the right things at the right time. For instance, the early years are about building the disposition for learning and discovery. And we have to do what is developmentally appropriate at different stages of a child's education. Seeking to hothouse our children when they are in kindergarten and preparing them in advance for primary school generates stress and then boredom when they enter primary school. Second, each child is different in interests, aptitudes and rates of development. Ideally, our system must allow each to learn at his or her own pace customised to his or her different learning styles. But everyone must be encouraged to put in effort. Third, we must develop students with a Singapore heartbeat, with empathy for others, a regard for the common, group, for the common good, and a shared sense of responsibility for Singapore's well-being and future. So in the next phase of our Singapore conversation, we can discuss the various policy options. For example, the PSLE serves as an objective benchmark for secondary school posting today. So important questions that we need to discuss include how do we maintain our rigorous standards and accountability and whether we can allocate all secondary school places without an objective benchmark like the PSLE. Are there alternative posting systems that are still objective but can minimise the current overemphasis on academic results and enhance social inclusion? To what extent should choice or proximity to a school be a consideration in secondary school posting, as some have suggested? Mr. Kantiampo suggested that we stop publishing the PSLE cutoff points of schools, and indeed that can be something that we, we can look into. Mr. Nispoas spoke about a model of a true train from pre-primary, a preschool, all the way to secondary school. And Mr. Yi spoke 
of some other methods. Now let me say that as an, another example, streaming at the secondary level allows us to tailor instruction to the abilities and learning styles of our students. But some have questioned if we should rethink whether streaming is absolutely necessary, as Dr. Intan had said earlier. So important questions to discuss at the next phase is, can we ensure that every child can learn at his or her own pace if there's no streaming? Will our schools be even less diverse if we did not have students from various academic streams? Can we replicate what we have done at the primary level, such as subject-based bending at the secondary level? And that was the specific suggestion of Dr. Intan. Now, all of this can be discussed and debated thoroughly. I want to say that whatever we do, we must be deliberate and thoughtful about what we need to change, how fast we can change, and how far we can sustain these changes. We must have the resources to sustain any change. I've been watching the debates on resources in various countries, and countries that have started with a big bang have had to now have very painful changes in order to cut back. Education is a long-term endeavour and always a work in progress. And the results of our action today, good or bad, are evident only many years down the road. So even as we address current issues, we must be as thoughtful as we possibly can. Now, it is also critical for us not to see our education system in isolation. Education alone cannot enable Singaporeans to realise our aspirations. If our society fails, the able will emigrate and the rest of us will be stuck here in failure. But if we stay and move together, we can succeed together. Education alone cannot give us a good life and we need to be clear what a good life is. If a good life is simply about getting ahead of others and achieving the five C's, in the cash, condo, cars, credit card and country club, the competitive pressure in the workplace will define how we as parents and teachers view education. Then no amount of changes in the education system can alter the reality of each of us chasing after material and positional goods. We cannot have broader definitions of success in education without our society accepting broader definitions of success in life. In many respects, the education system reflects societal norms and expectations. So I thank all members, as well as Singaporeans and educators, who have participated in our Singapore Conversation Sessions for raising these complex issues. MOE will continue these discussions by organising focused sessions, and I look forward to hearing further views. Madam Speaker, allow me to sum up. I have spoken today about providing the best opportunities for every child, starting from quality kindergartens to the levelling up efforts that we will roll out in our primary and secondary schools, and reiterated the importance of a holistic education centred on values. We have built, built up a strong education system to, deliver, to develop all our students, and not just a select few, because every child every Singaporean is precious. And we constantly seek to improve, to better nurture our next generation so that they can grow up to become the Singaporeans who will bring about the Singapore we aspire to us. And our children are the change we hope for. So I look forward to many more constructive conversations with my fellow Singaporeans. Thank you.